All right, thanks. Uh, I can think of the last time I closed. I was so good, I, they turned me back into a starter. So I uh, apologize for, uh, for, for being last, but uh, this is a great opportunity. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when Dylan called and the New York Yankees popped up on my phone, I was, you know, taken back a little bit. But great opportunity for me. I'll, I'll share my story, talk to Jeff, and just give you a little bit of background on myself. I know I've, I've spoken to, to several of you. I've played with a couple in this room, and uh, there's always a crossroads, you know, college, playing, professional. I've had a lot of people very interested in making a transition from, you know, going from, from baseball to softball. So uh, this is an opportunity for me to share my story and then get into a little bit of the, the nuts and bolts of coaching. Um, so my story is pretty, pretty simple. I was a, a baseball player from Southern California. Uh, started my career at uh, Cerritos Junior College in, uh, in, in Cerritos, California. Actually, Norwalk is the, where the school is. I was, I was so good, I got to play there for three years. So I, uh, I redshirted a year, and then from there, I uh, was fortunate enough to move on to Oklahoma. I uh, played two seasons at Oklahoma. Uh, my, just back a little bit, just like everybody probably at one point in time, they were, they were a hitter, uh, played infield position, and uh, ultimately slider ruined my uh, hitting career. And moved over to the pitching side. And um, from there, I went to Oklahoma. Uh, I played at Oklahoma for two seasons. We won the College World Series my junior year. Was drafted in the 25th round in, uh, in 95. Played with the Phillies for a couple seasons, two spring trainings, one season. And then from there, it was a decision of, of what to do. So my first job was, uh, was baseball coach at Oral Roberts University in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I spent a season and a half there, kind of an odd transition. Um, but from there, an opportunity to coach softball came up and uh, moved. Went to Norman, Oklahoma at, at my alma mater, coached softball there for four seasons. Um, the biggest thing that I can, I guess, share more than anything was this, just what, at that point in time, once I left the baseball world, I, I really knew that I probably wasn't going to come back to softball. Had one opportunity from, uh, from softball to go back to baseball. And to be honest with you, I chose softball over baseball because of uh, the, the athlete. Coaching the, uh, coaching the women that I've been able to coach and the knowledge that they want and the work ethic that they possess was just uh, was something I couldn't, uh, I couldn't even tell you that I knew until I had an opportunity to coach. And so um, from there, I, I went to Wichita State as, my head, as a head coach, and uh, I've now spent the last 14 seasons at Florida. Um, and uh, I've coached professionally. Um, so I coached two seasons of professional softball, as Vanessa mentioned. Not a big paycheck in the professional world, but you have people there that really love the game and at the height of the game and can really, really play, um, especially on the hitting side. Uh, I've done two, two stints with Team USA and coached the junior stuff as well. So that's kind of who I am and, uh, and, and what I've done to get here. And, and, and like Dylan mentioned, hitting is hitting. And um, when I first got into the game in 1999, um, hitting wasn't hitting, especially on the softball side. Um, everybody was a really short swing. Uh, the follow through was also short, hitting your back at some point in time. It's just a different thing that I've ever seen. And so one of my main reasons for staying in the sport was just the, the amount of success that I could see at a quick, quick time. So in 98, um, I think our team hit 39 home runs. and 99, our team hit 85 home runs, um, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and what the word that I always got was, well, you, you can't teach that to, to, the, to our, you know, the athletes. That's a baseball swing. And uh, again, sitting in the back of the room and listening to the speakers and talking about kinetic chain and all the other things that go into it, you sit there and I'm going, man, I'm, I knew I wasn't very smart, but now I'm listening to people talk about things, no idea what they mean. And I, I, I just know that there's, a, there, there's the, the thing that Jeff said, you have to learn something new every day. And, and this is a great opportunity for me to go in and, and tell you just how I I coach my athletes and some of the things that I've done and uh, I found to be very successful. So I'm going to get in talking about, um, talking about hitting, talking about coaching, and uh, I'm going to give you the dumbed down version of, of some of the other things that you probably learned here today that I found for me to be very successful. Um, I have uh, I've really kind of put together some things about the individual, and I think that uh, the reason I, I focus so much on the individual um, is that I believe one of the three things that Jeff asked yesterday about um, you know, what are the three most important things for hitting fundamentals, and I think confidence, uh, when I wrote down my three things yesterday, I think confidence is one of my three things that's one of the most important things um, to develop in hitters, 
And obviously some are born with confidence, some gain confidence as they go. So I created this little worksheet. And uh, on the worksheet that I've created, I I put one of my hitters up there. Uh, It's Amanda Lorenz. And if you know anything about softball, uh, she's probably one of the greatest hitters of all time uh, in the sport of softball. The greatest hitter I've ever coached, uh, especially not having the ability to bunt or beat out a whole lot of infield swing or infield hits. She's she's a hitter. And what I've done with um, with Amanda and Amanda and everybody else is we, we sit down and we talk about things. Um, that are really important to her. So one of the first things um, that, that I like to do with every hitter is just get a good understanding of themselves. Um, what I've done is this little chart here is, is, is kind of her hot and cold zones. And um, these are things that we create as a, as, as a collective group. I've played and done a lot of things. I, when I went to pro ball, um, and I, I was 86 to 88, occasional 90, 91, 92, um, decent curveball, pretty good changeup, and I wanted a slider. I wanted to figure out how to how to get uh, right-handed hitters out uh, and get get lefty. So I, I went to my pitching coach and said, "Hey, I want to want to throw a slider. Can you tell me how to throw that?" And uh, guy gets on the mound. Or, or we're playing catch, and he throws it. And he goes, "You throw it like that." Um, I'm like, "No, no. How do you grip it? How do you throw it?" And he, "Well, here, you put your hand on here. You do it like." That's so many. I can tell you so many experiences of how many times someone coached me on how to do it. And they never really asked me questions. They never really taught. I had a double jointed thumb, so I could I tuck my curveball. So slider was a little bit different. I couldn't get my thumb in the right place, get my fingers in the right place. But so much of coaching is just, hey, do it like this, do it like that. And I really like to dive into the self and get a true understanding of who that person is. So with Amanda, uh, this is what we talk about a lot. Um, we set goals. And um, so here's a kid who comes out of Southern California, very, very, very successful youth hitter. Um, and comes to the to, to collegiate world, well, the one thing she struggles with the most is failure. She's never failed before. She was a six or 700 hitter in high school and travel, so her success rate super, super high. And so we had to deal with the failure and deal with the expectations of getting on or getting out. And so one of the things I asked her is, well, tell me what you want to do. She goes, well, I, I hate hitting the ball. I hate, I hate popping up. I hate flying out and I hate striking out. So right there already you have an apprehension of something. And so um, we've created a, a true understanding of, well, if you're not going to hit the ball in the air, you're probably not going to hit a ton of home runs. If you don't strike out, you're probably going to you know, have, have some poor contact and early in the counts because you're, you're trying not to hit the ball in the air and you're trying not to strike out, so you're not going to swing and miss that much. So this is really beneficial for me to, to work with a high, high-level hitter to really understand what it is for her that she wants to be successful at. So, um, and I'm not saying that every hitter has to have a, I think every hitter has a true uh, f- a fear of something or they have something that they really want to do and you want to measure and balance the expectation. So uh, I created this little thing for, for, for all my hitters and they have to do, fill out a little, tell me what you're good at, tell me what you're not good at, tell me what you want to do and tell, you what, tell me how you want to do it. And so it was really, really, really good. I'm not somebody who believes really in a two strike adjustment. Um, I don't really want to have somebody go up there with a B swing and two strikes just to put the ball in play. And so with every type of hitter, we, we talk about, uh, you know, what that looks like. So with, uh, with Amanda, she's really good at, at, at the green indicates the good, the yellow is uh, okay at times. And then the red are clear, um, you know, just not good at. And so she wasn't really good at the, the inside pitch very much. She, she liked the ball out over the plate. She loved hitting the ball left center. And so with that, um, for her, she had a little bit of a flatter swing. And so the elevated pitch was a lot easier for her to handle. Um, and at, at times, I really wanted it to, to fall victim to the, to the launch angle. This is a great hitter. She possesses hand-eye coordination, competitiveness, work ethic. But as we started to work, the more we got the barrel down below, the more the ball went in the air. So yes, she hit some home runs, but the more she... F- she started to hit the ball in the air and, and fail in her mind. So we stayed flat. We, I let her be who she was um, pretty quickly. I, I recognized just how good she was at hitting the elevated pitches, hitting the outside pitches. And uh, it, it was really, really good. But I wouldn't probably know some of the things without having conversations with her. And um, some of the conversations I had was, you know, what do you really want to do? And she talked about, um, you know, I, I want to get a hit every time. And Watching Derek Jeter and watching his career and listening to some things that he talked about, that was his same goal. I, I want to get a hit every time. Learning how to deal with the failure is how I understood that I wasn't going to get a hit every time, but if I ever lost that mentality in the box, I probably wouldn't have been as good as I was over a sustained period of time. So 
getting to know the hitter, getting to know the person to me is really, really important. Um, I think that, uh, again, we can, we can study and, and, and look at all kinds of different metrics, but getting somebody to understand who they are to me is the one, um, one thing that I, I feel like I can control the most and, and really control the levels of confidence. With Amanda, again, I'll use Amanda as a freshman year to sophomore year to junior year to senior year. Her sophomore year, we, we, we spent the offseason talking about her swing and talking about production and development. And probably one of the biggest turning points for, for her in, in, in our career, because we were working together, was trying to balance the expectation with the, um, uh, with, with the work ethic. So as everybody talks about working and, and what hard work looks like and how we work, here's a kid who doesn't want to fail. She doesn't want to, she, she wants to master her swing. She's a perfectionist. So we created a model for her different than everybody else on our team. And um, so as I say this to you, and I know there's a lot of different levels of, of, of coach in this room. For me, for her, she wanted to work on her swing so much that we just created a window of the day that she could come in and work as long as she wanted to without the, the time of, hey, we've got to rotate to the next station. Hey, we've got to go do this. We've got to do that. So we were able to balance. She's probably one of the only persons that I've ever coached that almost outworked her expectations. And what I mean by that is every great sports psychologist will tell you you're never going to outwork your expectations. She's one of those that actually worked as hard as she expected to, to do. Where we work, we get a lot of athletes and you know, they'll tell us how good they want to be. They want to be an All-American. They want to go to the big leagues. They want to do whatever. But they just don't have the work ethic to back it up. And she's probably one of the only players that I've ever had that really, truly understood what work ethic really meant for her. So I think that's uh, something that I, that I always talk to all my players about. Everybody wants to be good, but I don't know that everybody has either the skill set or the work ethic to, to be there. So um, we started to do something a little bit different here in the, um, in the last couple, of, actually just this last year. Um, I, I, and again, I'm not going to get too, too, too technical in regards to different things, but we started doing some stuff with tunneling and, um, and Perry Cousins had some interesting thoughts on some things. So we, um, we created a, 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 little, a little exercise here um, that I've really, really liked. And so tying in all the different technology pieces, I've been somebody, I, I used Zep when it, was, uh, uh, when it was there. I used Diamond Kinetics and we've transitioned now to Blast. And um, I have a, 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 you can see the pocket radar display and there's Rap Soto. And so when I tell you all these things, you're, you're probably not going to, I'm not a huge tech person. Um, I am, and I have somebody on my staff that really does a good job of breaking some of this stuff down with video and, and bat speeds and different things. But I just don't have the time in what I do to be able to be really good at all these things. And so um, I have a, a, a coach that uh, with me that's been, this is his third season came from the University of Tennessee as a baseball coach, has coached baseball his whole life. He's, a, he's really a mathematician at, at, at heart, and so he can break down a lot of things with blast and all the different numbers. So we really created this baseline test, and um, I'll, I'll play it here real quick and then go through some stuff. Um, this, is a, this is a girl. She's a senior. Kendall Lindemann's her name. She's a, a three-time All-American. Um, the next slide will just show, and I'm going to come backwards here real quick. Um, the next slide shows some, some different things. So when you just watch that quick video, and I'm going to go backwards and do it again. So I'm telling you this is, I, we, we set up the, the target for a baseline test, and we're doing it with a softball. We set the tee up. We're trying to get 10 degrees of launch angle is what I was been told. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm being truthful here. My assistant coaches tell me exactly what, we're, we're looking for 10 degrees here for a baseline test. We're trying to get her to hit the ball in the middle of the field at 10 degrees. On this, I think it equated to about 174 feet, which isn't good as far as ball flight's concerned for us. But the things that we're looking for, and if you go back, we saw 79 miles an hour on the bat speed, on the exit speed. The 10 degrees was hit, okay? And I think we're only off by maybe one degree to the right um, in regards to the location of where the ball was hit. So from, a, from an honest observer, I watched that swing, and I said, all right, let's use that one because she hit it as close to, to possible in the center of that hula hoop that we designed. Um, so now I'll go backwards here again. So we've created this little, little small test. And again, I think this, was, this came from Perry Cousins and we put this test in and it's been really, really, really good. Now here's the difference between coaching a guy and maybe coaching a girl at times. So we put this test in. And so now what does everybody want to do? They want to hit the ball in the hula hoop. So we're getting swings 
and they're not exactly max effort swings or swing as hard as you can with the minimal effort and whatever the words or terminology that you would use to teach. So we create this test and now we're trying to get our hitters to swing. Hey, I want you to swing harder. We want to get to where you're swinging more game-like. So hit it as hard as you can through the hula hoop. And let's see the exit speed numbers go up. But what we don't want to try to do is we don't want to lose control. So we're trying to minimize our misses. We're trying to maximize when we do miss hitting the ball in the wrong spot. Can we hit a hard ground wall over the middle? Can we just get maybe 13 degrees and the ball goes over the fence to 240? Whatever that is. So this has been really, really good for us um, to get a good baseline. So I walked up, watched this swing, said, all right, let me take a picture of that. So I'm going to use that in my presentation. And then Eric, my coach, comes up and he goes, hey, and you picked a great swing. That was pretty close to perfect. We're only one degree off. And so I, I think at the end of the day, it really confirmed to me that our testing that we're using is, is really good. So we use this as a baseline just to try to get our hitters to swing hard but still get the, the ball control. We also do this with a heavy ball. And um, this has been pretty interesting to me. When you start doing it with a heavy ball, how fast and how quick the control goes away. And one thing I like about the heavy ball is when you face somebody who's throwing a pitch that's hard down, or maybe a pitch that's going uh, more down than, than up, but the, the, the impact changes and it really impacts the contact. So um, we've been using this with the heavy ball uh, and the light ball, but I, I really have been, um, been very, uh, I'll go back and do it one more time and play it one more time just for the heck of it. So something pretty simple. Now, she's, she's somebody who hits the ball. Um, she's probably 15, 16. She's a little bit steeper barrel, hits the ball really far, really high. And when she does miss, obviously, it's a, it's a fly ball, and we're, and we're all good with that um, with, with Kendall and her situation. So um, as I'm working to build confidence and try to get, uh, I, I was talking to, to a former teammate and he talked about the number of players in his organization that he's impacted uh, in the last season of ball and, and the number of players that comes to your, come to your team and leaves your team, goes up, goes down, draft picks and all the other stuff. So for me, creating a common language may be a little bit easier than maybe for some of you because I have players for four years. We don't have the draft that takes our players out of our program. So what I do the first day is gonna be able to go through a four year period. But what I do wanna create is a common language with all my hitters so that we are all talking about the same things. Um, what, what are your favorite pitches? What do you like to hit? What do you not like to hit? Um, and, and listening earlier, talking, if you don't like change ups, if you don't like to swing at high pitches, just don't let the other team know um, as, as, as quick as, as you may know. Um, so the things that I've found over the years to be different, and, and I'm sure all of you guys are in the same. I've seen a lot of uh, familiar faces. I've seen a lot of people that have done this for a while. Um, we all talk about the athletes are changing and what do we do to, to impact change. And um, I think some things that are really important for me is the athletes have always changed and it's our job to adapt with them. And that's where the technology pieces come in. That's where the education comes in. But at the end of the day, a relationship's a relationship. Communication is communication. It never changes. Um, but the athletes change, so you have to figure out how to get your point across to them uh, as, qu as quickly as possible. So I made this uh, little thing a few years ago um, that I like, especially when I'm talking to, uh, to hitters. Um, what I did was I basically took the plate, and one of the things I always ask my hitters, obviously, is, is, is how big is the plate, how wide is the plate, and you'd be surprised at how many just don't know that it's 17 inches wide and um, all the other things that go into that. So I've created this. When I first did this, I did a six-ball design, so I just kept the ball on the plate. And then the NCAA came out with a, a better graph and a better chart of what the uh, strike zone is and what the plate looks like and how big the ball is. And I think it's two and a quarter inch in diameter. So I've made this to be a seven ball approach. And what I've done with my hitters is, you know, from a right-handed perspective, the closest ball is one, the furthest ball is seven. And then from the left-handed approach, it's the same thing. So the closest ball, one to seven. I love it. Because one of the things that we're, we're really, we've really tried to work on hard is, is swinging at strikes. Um, and if you do swing at a bad pitch, I'd much rather you swing at a bad pitch with a good swing than swing at a good, swing at a good pitch with a bad swing. And so having terminology and having an understanding of what the plate looks like and what your strengths look like and your weaknesses look like, where I've been taught this, look in, look in and adjust away. Look away, adjust in. Cut the plate in half. What are all these things and what do they mean? And so we've just tried to really do a good job of creating some, some language. So if you have somebody that you're working with for the first day, and it may only be 10 days you work with them, it may be 10 weeks, they may be on rehab, or you're working with somebody for four years, 
just getting them to understand the, the plate. Because hey, where was that pitch? It was a ball. Okay, that's fine. Where was the pitch more specifically? It was inside. Or I'm looking middle in. Okay, more specifically, what are you looking for? You know, I really don't like to hit this pitch, the one ball. I can't hit the seven, but I really like the three, four, five. Okay, now we've got a better understanding of what it is that your strength and weakness look like. So I think not only a common language within, um, you know, understanding pitch selection, but even a common language in mechanics. Um, because I think that there's so many different ways to talk about mechanics that creating a common language to me is, is the easiest way to build a trusting relationship where the hitter is going to understand, you know, kind of what they do. So um, I found, I, I just built a, a, put it backwards, I just built a couple of brackets on the back and um, it came out to be um, pretty good for, for us to have, to have dialogue. Um, going to, to the confidence sheet, um, this is a, a, my whole... Um, and if anybody ever wanted anything or if you had a, just shoot me an email. Um, our Gator system is all pretty simple. It's a Tim W. And then the rest of it's our Gator emails. All of our Gator emails are the same. So I'd be happy to send anybody this. This probably took me 10 years to develop. Um, and I, I can't tell you how much um, I love it. It is, it's a self-evaluation sheet. And the things that I love about this are that there's so many players that you think are good that just don't have the confidence in themselves. They think they're a lot worse than you think they are. And so I've created this uh, self-evaluation sheet from a hitting perspective, because this obviously is hitting. The few things, the few, uh, few things I put on this are, um, aren't, I'm sorry, uh, hitting. Now, how, how good of a hitter do you think you are? Are you the worst hitter or the best hitter? Keep it five categories as easy as for me. Do you hit for power? Tell me about your situational hitting, short game, and then your mentality. And then there's some arm strength, accuracy, glove, range. And then there's some, some, some personal characteristics on there. your character. And I found that this has been probably the easiest thing for me to do to make my players enjoy their experience more than anything else. Because now I'm not telling them they're not playing. I'm not telling them they're not good at something. They're telling me they're not good at something. They're telling me they want to improve on something. And now we have got a collaboration of two people at least that are helping us get to the same point. So now at the end of the year, they may only have 10 at-bats or they may not perform very well, but at least it's more of, a, of an objective measurable as opposed to being so subjective. All coaches tell players, well, you just weren't good enough. You just don't hit well enough. You don't run well enough. You don't do whatever. Now this is them. They're putting the, the, the ownership on themselves. And in so many cases, I can tell you that I have to take my unrealistic, delusional player and I have to bring them back down to reality. And then the opposite, I take the player that is really good, but I have to actually take their numbers higher. And so we work this as a collaboration. We sit down and do this. Um, again, this is probably something that's a little easier to do with somebody that you're going to coach over time as opposed to maybe coaching somebody from right away. But you'd be surprised how many people really lack some, some confidence one of the things that I love on here that I, that I put uh, is, is, is work ethic. And um, it's also amazing to me how hard people think they work and um, how, in my opinion, they, they really don't. They don't work hard. They may get their swings in, but there wasn't a purpose. Or they may get their reps in, and it was just, uh, you know, just something simple rep. And, um, and the two things I find on that are the, uh, are the work ethic and, and how they feel they are as a teammate. And so I use my, my simple measurement as this, is oh, your, your kid will tell me I'm a five worker. So you're the, you're the hardest working player I've ever seen. Yeah, I'm a hard, I really work hard. And then in the teammate category, they'll say, I'm, I'm a really, really, really good teammate. And I'll say, okay, well, after practice last night, you went to dinner, you studied, and you, yeah, and I came back and hit like I always do. Every night I come and hit. Awesome, you're a five teammate as well. Yeah, oh yeah. So when you were hitting last night with your teammates, you know, what did you, what would you guys work on? Well, I didn't work with my team. I just came up here by myself and hit by myself. And it's like, well, then how can you say you're a great teammate if you didn't bring somebody along to try to help them improve and get better too? So these things are really, really good uh, exercise. But like I said, it's probably a little more for, for those that you get a coach over time. Uh, maybe it's even your own kids. I found that, you know, my own kids are somebody that I'm obviously, I, I, I don't coach them up as much as I probably should. I coach my players up probably a little bit more. Bringing myself to the work ethic as I, as I talked to uh, uh, about on that sheet, um, I, I can tell you um, the, the thing that I love about learning um, for me is really how to apply learning. And 
I can tell you just how many times I've made a mistake. And I wouldn't know that I made a mistake. Obviously, I'm not going to do something I think is going to, to fail or not going to be successful. Or, but I can go through all the different things that we've heard throughout our, our, our career as, as hitting people or people that have listened to other people talk about hitting. And you know, what my favorite one was squash the bug. Or you know, when I learned how to hit, you know, the, 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 my best tech, hey, you got to get your elbow up. You know, really got to get your, all the good hitters get their elbow up. So I was Daryl Strawberry growing up. I had my elbow up high and you know, did all the things that we did do. But um, I think the one thing that's missing in learning is application. And I think learning how to and learning how not to do things are really, really important. To be a good coach, all the how not to's, and maybe you see somebody else doing something, I hey, don't do that, or you try something that doesn't work. How not to's are really important. I just think if once you figure out how not to, then don't do it again. But it still helps you go in a better direction forward because you've learned how to apply something that really didn't work, uh, whether it be for that hitter or for your, for your hitters in general. So um, I made a, a, a really important thing for me is, is, is I'm a process-oriented person. So I'll go backwards to where my work ethic came from. None of my family in my history of family has ever played sports raced motorcycles, went to the lake, skied. So outdoors, yes, but no sports, no team activity. So I played um, baseball. Uh, I left racing motorcycles, which is all my family ever did at 12. And I started playing baseball. And I love baseball. And I would ride my bike. I would get there an hour and a half early. I just, I don't know what it was about baseball that I loved, but I loved it. So I go to a junior college, my first day at Cerritos Junior College. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try out for the baseball team. And it's, it's going to be awesome practice or tryouts start at two so I show up I get there about 120 and I, I walk on the field and I, I, I look I'm like oh my gosh I'm late right there's a hundred people on the field there's 47 third basemen there's guys taking fly balls everybody's in the cages I couldn't believe what I saw and from that feeling of thinking I was late and and again this is my next step after high school I chose to be here it was the most it hurt my stomach so bad to think that I was late. So from that day forward, I was never, and again, it did start at two, but all the guys that were there were all the returning guys that realized that two o'clock meant 1230. And I didn't know that that's what it was like to be, to play baseball. Baseball practice was at two and most guys showed up at two and I was always early, but now I realize that these are a different level of player, a different level of athlete, Two o'clock meant you're an hour and a half early. And so from that, that developed kind of my frame of thought for work ethic. And so that's the way I coach. That's the way I, I, I operate. Everything I do has got to be early or you're going to be late because I don't ever want to experience that feeling again. And not everybody has that. And I, and I recognize that it's, it's okay trait to have, um, but you have to recognize that for, so I'm a process and routine person um, that uh, I'm really, really important. On this quote, I have a quote down here, um, the, the definition of insanity. And so I, I wrote that because I thought it was really valid, to, especially for this, this conversation. Um, my teams have won the College World Series twice. Um, my teams have, uh, I think we led the country in home runs. My teams led the country in um, ERA. Um, over the past five years, I think we've been number one or number two in team fielding percentage. I think all five years. I don't know the exact statistic. So we've, I've known that I've been to the College World Series ten times, and we've lost eight times. So in that mind, I'm like, gosh, I, we we're failing at a high rate. We've played for the College World Series finals, the, 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 the series championship, five times, only won it twice. So again, below the 50 percentile number. The relevance to that is when you go and you play at a high level, you recognize your deficiencies. You see what you're not good at. And for us to win the College World Series, it didn't work by hitting home runs because in the College World Series finals, you don't hit a whole lot of home runs. Pitching's good, coaching's good, pressure's high. So we had to get, do something a little different. So we really have put a lot more focus in recruiting a total athlete that can play defense and hit, but maybe not just a hitter. And so our numbers have kind of gone down a little bit. Um, the bat has changed in our game, so those, again, number goes down. We're in a humid environment, so our home run numbers have been a little bit lower. So the definition of insanity, obviously, is do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results. Uh, I've been a huge front toss guy my whole entire career, um, baseball and softball, and I love front toss, 
because it's a good dialogue, it's good interaction. I can see what the ball looks like. The relationship in the cage is something that's very, very special to me. I've always liked that. However, in my mind, front toss is a good feeling. You can get a, you can, you reproduce the swing over and over again, but it's not necessarily what the pitches do on game day. So we've really started to see our numbers kind of trending downward in the power and in the RBIs and all the other things. And so one of the things that we've really looked at is why are we not as good offensively? Well, number one, we're recruiting maybe a little bit more of a, a total package player, defense, offense, athleticism, maybe not just the hitter. Two, and I give the credit to really the pitchers and the, and the pitching coaches, there's more speeds in the game now than there were before. When I got in the game, you threw, you, you lucky to have a pitcher with one out pitch. Um, she threw a hard pitch and a slow pitch. Well, now you're seeing pitchers in our game, and I, obviously I see you, Darvish, is probably the best example I can give in baseball, but you see pitchers in our game now touching, and I'll say touching, 39 miles an hour and all the way up to 70 miles an hour. So you start to see varieties of speed, which then throws the timing off, which, which then ultimately changes the, the production of a hitter. So we're starting to really take the technology that we're getting, different spin rates, different velocities, different locations, and we're starting to apply it probably like what Coach Michael Latif's been doing for years and then starting to use more machines. Now, when I grew up, machines, that was what ruined swings. You, you couldn't hit off a machine. It was bad for my swing. It wasn't any good. I didn't like what it felt like. And so that's how I've always felt. I always saw the difference when our hitters hit off the machine and when they hit off live pitching. Well, the problem with live pitching, you're closer. The reaction time changes. So I felt like some of the habits we were developing weren't really translating into high-level performance. So we're doing a lot more machine work now this year. Um, and so I put in there a theme. So I found it to be very, very beneficial to create themes. Uh, in other words, you're not just sitting there trying to throw a change up, um, not just trying to sit there and throw a, a drop or a curve. Um, a, a friend of mine, uh, and uh, again, we've become friends through, uh, um, through game, but Howard Johnson. So Hojo gave me a quote one time that I thought was really, really interesting. He's with the Mets. He's the hitting uh, coach in the big leagues. And the year before that, and everybody's got all the data and all the breakdowns, they were the worst hitting team in all of Major League Baseball with a curveball. So for 40 days at spring training, the, the, the Mets bought however many pitching machines, and they've got all their guys hitting off curveballs. And, man, next thing you know, the Mets can hit curveballs, really do a good job the next year. when they're not, They lost the fastball, couldn't hit the fastball. So obviously, just like anything, trends start to change. So I, what I didn't want to do is maybe take our team's deficiency and magnify that by just being good at one pitch. So we trend out a little bit and we try to, to theme or create days where we can do different things. And so um, obviously when you have a right-hander in the cage and left-hander in the cage, nothing worse than having to kick the, the leg of the machine to move it over to get the ball inside to the right-hander but away to the left-hander or inside to the left-hander, away to the right. It's just, just a frustrating process. So just adding a home plate, taking a plate and moving the plate for each hitter as opposed to moving the machine was like mind-blowing to me. So we start moving the plates and we start creating themes. And now the next thing you know, we're able to hit rise balls better. We're able to hit drop balls better. We're able to hit in, out, and start changing speed. So the one thing I would obviously caution somebody to do with machines is to maybe have one speed or one thing that you're working on because you might be really, really good at that speed. But then the next thing you know, the book's going to get out on you. You can't hit some other speeds. And so trying to create a, a, a complete work ethic, a complete process um, seems to be something that, that I like. Um, I've heard this today. I've only, I got here late yesterday, and I apologize if I, if I repeat something that someone else says or I make one of the most dumb statements ever made. But one of the things that, that I've always heard, and I've been guilty of this is too, is, hey, you've got to use your lower half. You've got to use your legs. You've got to hit with your legs. You've got to, you've got to use your backside. And backside's probably been something that I've heard more than anything as a, as a young player and as a young coach and listening to some really good you know, hitting coaches talk. Um, but one of the things that I've found that by just using, focusing and talking about the backside is what does the front side do? What is the front side doing? And are there deficiencies? Because you'll watch, watch video with a kid and they don't even get their back heel off the ground very high and they're turning, but yet they're turning against their front side because we've all said we have to hit against our front side and use all these different terms. So uh, one thing I'm actually stepping out of my comfort zone a little bit is, is actually talking a little bit more with some of my hitters with their front side. Um, and we do a lot of the same um, biometric tests and force plate things to figure out exactly where someone's strong and weak and deficient and efficient potentially. 
But one of the things I found that, that's really helped is, is actually starting to talk a little bit about the front hip or the front side of the body. And it's amazing how some of the kids can actually start to turn and get through the ball a little bit better. And the hips, one of the things I see in softball, and I don't know how this is in baseball, but I see when we watch high-speed video, our hitters hit, and at times then they'll swing as opposed to potentially keeping those two together a little bit longer. And I don't know if that's a male or female or bad coaching thing. Something's, there's a disconnect there, and we're trying to improve that connection as much as possible. So um, the, thing that I, the reason I chose this, um, when I talked to Jeff, I, I wanted to talk about how do I take an amateur hitter and turn them into a true professional? And that's why I used Amanda Lorenz at the beginning. Um, getting our players to understand um, you know, how to work and what to work on and some of the things that work. So I put this little checkoff list things here um, of T-work, weighted balls, the bat speed program. Bat speed program to me is really, really, really interesting. The problem I have with implementing a bat speed program is the time that it takes to implement that. And in coaching women versus coaching men, girls don't dry swing. They just don't dry swing. And I don't know if it's because we can't use a weighted bat or we don't, we, never, we don't even know what a donut is or there's certain things that they've never done, but girls just won't dry swing. So when you get a dry swing and you try to do a bat speed program, it's like it just doesn't look right a lot of times. So um, I would always caution anybody to, to, to come up with ideas to make sure that obviously if you're doing something to make it look as real as possible. Um, the, uh, the, the one thing I'll, I'll mention here is video, and I think this is, this is probably one of the things that uh, I love, I, I, I would agree with Vanessa when she talked about the old videotapes. I loved old video. I loved watching old video and fast forward and rewinding and doing those things. It didn't show as many flaws, so it was a lot easier to coach. Now you got the high speed cameras, you can see a lot more mistakes. But I love video. But I will tell you that when I, when I spend time watching video with, um, with my athletes, and, and I would probably assume that at least 75% of our, our young population is, is our visual learners because of what they do and the screen time that they have. They don't even talk to each other anymore. They Snapchat each other. They're just doing so many things that, that, that aren't really communicative relationships that watching video to me is something interesting, but it takes time. And so I'm sure, for just like everybody else, I don't have time to watch video with every single hitter that we have on their swings. So coming up with a way for the hitters to watch so let's, let's just use an example. I'm hitting on the field, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a five, four or five pitch sequence, and it's probably off a live arm. Video it, have a, a delayed app where you can now display it on your scoreboard, and now they can watch their swings after they hit, and they can apply either the words or what they felt to what they see is a fast way for me to get something across to them. Um, or you can hold an iPad, or you can hold an iPhone, or whatever it would be that you would do that with. But the one thing that I would tell you that I, I've found from, from, uh, from experience is when someone watches their swing, they don't always see the same thing that you see. And so when I watch film, it, it's amazing to me when I watch film, sometimes like, oh, I, I don't look very good. And, and, and girls are funny because they'll, sometimes they'll talk about their physical attributes as opposed to their swing. Oh, I don't like the way those pants look, or I don't like the way that looks, or I don't like the way this... And so it's amazing when they watch film by themselves versus watching with a coach, the difference and the way you can you know, kind of steer them in a direction. So I would tell you that sending your players their swings, having them watch their swings, there has to be a check-in process with a coach to making sure that they're seeing the same things that you're seeing. Um, because I do think there's a lot of amateur hitters that may try to, try to attain perfection, and you being able to channel that could, could really help um, you know, steer them in the right direction. Um, the, the going to, from again, from a, a, a player of uh, being an amateur to a, to a professional is truly understanding a makeup. And um, makeup, mentality, mental toughness. Again, I've worked with enough really good uh, mental strategists, uh, sports psychologists, uh, those kind of people. I've worked with enough. They'll tell you all the time, and they'll always tell you this, that, you know, that once you take an even player, that 90% of the game is mental and the other 10% is physical. And I know for a fact that I don't spend 90% of the time on our mental. I spend 90% physical and 10% mental, just like everybody else um, probably does. But the things that I have, um, that if you get somebody who's afraid of the ball, and, and I'm sure everybody has had that. And, and again, they can be the biggest, strongest. When they're afraid of the ball, they're afraid of the ball. And there is not a whole lot you can do. And, and so we just, I don't want to say we ignore it, but it's almost like having the yips. You just kind of ignore it a little bit, and you hope you can throw enough inside pitches to get some confidence. 
Um, you know, again, throwing balls. I don't, I don't throw balls at, at hitters, but I do throw pitches. Uh, I, I do teach my hitters how to get hit by pitch um, so that they can understand safety and the importance of safety. Um, but being afraid of the ball is really one of, the, one of those, um, you know, tough things to, to really overcome. Um, but the final thing is, is, or the first thing there is, what kind of hitter are you? And are you a power hitter? Um, I, I've always heard these, these, this is one of the most bragging things that a, that a coach has always, hey, she doesn't strike out at all. She doesn't strike out. And um, so there's a lot of value to some, um, to some people that thinking that striking out is a, is a really bad thing and you can't strike out. And so that kind of frames what kind of hitter you are. Are you a power hitter? Are you a, a swing and miss hitter? You hit the ball opposite field? You know, what is it that you do? Um, and then, you know, then how do you adjust you know, your, your expectations with what really happens? And so um, being able to teach people how to, uh, mental toughness is, I think, is, a, is a, some of it's born with, some of it's being able to deal with failure. And then there's an education process, the being able to take the application of, you know, maybe some different activities, some different visualizations, some different exercises, some different notes or different things that you, what are you really afraid of? And then hopefully that can help build the confidence. So for us, I think a, a really good hitter is probably somewhere in the, the 330 to 400 range is a really good hitter. Um, for you, it may be a, a 260 to 280 hitter. And I think, you know, being able to understand the, the failure that goes in um, with all that stuff. So the, the difference between, um, you know, the mentality and the approach, uh, I think this is, this is something that I, I, I really, I'm kind of segueing myself into the, the, the final stages of, of what I was going to talk about, the difference between the personal development and actually doing things that's going to help your team win or doing things totally different than the personal development to win. Um, so being able to obviously train the eyes and test the eyes, Anytime I have a hitter that swings and miss a lot or makes poor decisions, I automatically go to my trainer and say, hey, can, can you get their eyes checked? Now, we are no, normal um, ophthalmologist or optometrist. I don't know that they're actually, you know, I mean, we all probably sat in there, especially me and my age. You get in there and you look at the letters and the charts. Now, I don't know that that actually translates to a hitter, what they see and the depth that they see at. So really try to, try to encourage our, our people to test a little bit deeper and further away make sure that the contacts or whatever else they need are at the right, uh, the right um, you know, percentages of what they're seeing. So um, these are all things that, um, that I think are important. Um, you know, we've really, again, if you hear my words about my transition from being a really good offensive team to actually winning more championships, um, we've gone from maybe hitting more home runs to, to a total, over, uh, total body of work and that I put a little bit more value, not a little bit, but a lot more value into the on-base percentage versus batting average. And I did that, number one, the reason I did it is because we weren't going to hit for as high of a batting average. We didn't have the horses, we didn't have the speed to hit for a high, high batting average, so it was a lot easier to put more value in on-base percentage. So that's part of my transition. So we have went to understanding that if we're not going to hit for a high, high average, we need to do a good job of swinging at pitches that we can hit, swinging at strikes, and so our walk rate has gone really, really, really high. Um, we've learned how to take pitches a little bit better. We've understood our strikes on a little bit better. And so I think being able to understand that, to get our hitters to understand that we want to hit, but we will take a walk is, is definitely a skill. It's not something you can just wake up one day and say, swing at strikes, be disciplined at the plate. So it's something that we've really worked on over time. Um, and I found a, we, we did, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a big, I don't want to promote products um, we use the, uh, a product called V-Flex, and I'm sure, I know they made a little bit of, made a, he made a little bit of way into to, to, to some big league camps and some other. I don't know how it works exactly, um, but I do know that since we started using that, our, our, our ability um, to swing at pitches that were really, really, really close to the zone that weren't really strikes has gone way, way up. And so um, I, I found that by using that and whatever translates to the brain, um, I think that there's some, there's some, um, there's some benefits from some certain visual products um, out there. But again, I can't, I'm not going to promote that to, to anybody. But I, I have seen a huge difference in our hitters from where we were to where we are now uh, in our overall product of a program. So um, I think the, uh, the, the final thing I'll talk about the, the person um, and then transition into the, to the, to the winning part or being able to make the adjustments um, I have one thing that I, whether it be video or one thing that I really try to talk to my hitters about, and that is, if the pitch is not a strike, who cares what the mechanics look like? And um, I, I know that sounds a little weird, but what, I'm, what I mean by that is, 
so many times you watch video back or you, you, you talk to your hitter after they got out and you say, you know, they said, yeah, I, I really felt like I, I, hit, I got out in front or I didn't hit that ball very well or let the ball get too deep or I was off balance or whatever it was that they'll say to you after a failure. And my immediate response was, was that pitch a strike? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's a strike. Well, don't beat yourself up over what you've looked like or felt like. If it wasn't a strike, your body is going to adjust to that pitch because you've had so many reps. So don't worry about that. So then I have the prove it mentality too. Go back to the video, watch it. If it was a strike and you look like that, okay, then that's what it looks like. But if it was a ball, why are we going to spend so much time evaluating what the swing looked like if the pitch wasn't over the plate, the body's, you're, you're probably, your hand eye is good enough, you're gonna make adjustments. So that's one thing that, that has really helped um, kind of deal with some of the failure is if you, if you can't swing at a strike or you didn't swing at a strike, then why are you spending so much time trying to figure out the answer? Um, this is the separate part. And so what I usually do in my, in my worksheets, the first slide I showed you and the, this slide are, are combined. So it's just a combined slide um, and, and I have all those words together on one piece of paper. So one of the things that, um, and I'll use some, just some different cliche phrases and things like that, but hitting behind the runner, um, being able to hit behind the runner, being able to move the runner, being able to score the runner, uh, things like that that I'm sure every one of us has heard at some point in time. So I do an everyday process of we, we hit and run every day, we move the runner from second to third every day, we score the runner from third to home every day. These are processes that we do with live base running or, or live swings to get our hitters to understand the toughest situation for me to coach is runner on second, no outs. And the easiest one to coach is the left-handed batter, okay? Well, don't do a whole lot different. The hardest one's the right-handed batter. And so um, when I grew up, when I played, when there's a runner on second base and our coach told us it was important, well, then it was important. We either had to bunt, we either had to try to hit behind the runner, we had to do something like that to get that. No matter what, if you get out, that runner's getting to third. And so that's where I put on there uh, the difference between the important play, which is a runner on second, no outs, and you have to get the runner to the third, or the Kendall Lindemans of the world, my, my, my hitter that I showed on the slide, I don't give her important. I don't want her to move the runner from second to third with no outs. I want her to score the runner. And if she gets out, she gets out. So we have, you know, have ways in which we practice and ways in which we do that. But the, the, thing, the thing, reason I find this the hardest to coach is because there are so many people that tell you that with a runner on second base and no outs, you have to hit, you know, if you're right-handed, you have to hit to, to right field. And if you're left-handed, you have to pull it. I have a harder time coaching the right-handed batter because I'll throw front toss and uh, get a runner on second base and no outs. And, and Susie can't hit the ball to right field. And so now I get a runner at second in scoring position, and I'm going to ask her to do something she can't do off front toss. Um, so you either have to practice it more with realistic um, velocity but I have so many times where hitters just aren't opposite field hitters. They can't hit behind the runner that well. And you put them into a situation like this that you're asking them to be somebody they're not. So um, the same example that I would give uh, as a runner on third. And I'll give two, two, two scenarios or two examples of this. So I had a freshman hitter. I did the same, I've done the same kind of worksheet since I've been coaching. I had a freshman hitter, runner on third and no outs. or I'm sorry, runner on third and less than two outs. What are you trying to do? And she says, I'm trying to hit a deep fly ball to the outfield. That's what I'm trying to do. So obviously that was taught. Obviously that was coached. And I, my immediate response is, well, if you're trying to do that with a runner on a third, why don't you just try to do that all the time? And she says, no, my God, coach told me I'm trying to get a ball elevated. Don't hit the ball in the dirt because the runner's going to get thrown out at the plate. So her mentality was, hey, I'm going to hit the ball uh, in the air in this situation. And it turned out, and I left her alone. I said, all right, prove that to me. It's great. And she was really good at it. And it turned out she ended up leading the country in sacrifice flies one year. She had a, a bunch. So she was really good at actually applying what, she was, what her frame was. Um, and I'll use my, my last scenario. Um, I, I use Jessica Mendoza. So I coached Jess, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen her on Sunday Night Baseball and stuff she's doing with the Mets. And I coached her first year of pro after she was done playing uh, with, with the Olympics. And, I, and she was, I mean, a great student of the game, great competitor. And we get bases loaded, and we do, a, we do some situational batting practice, and She's bases loaded. She's hitting top spin to second base, top spin to second base, pull in the 3-4 hole. And I asked her, I said, tell me what you're trying to do with bases loaded and, you know, and so again, runner on third base, but bases loaded and, you know, less than two outs. I'm trying to put pressure on the defense, she told me. And um, um, I, I just, I stopped for a minute. I, I, I what, you, pressure on the defense? She's, yeah, I'm trying to hit a ball hard, make, put pressure on them, make them have to throw them. Like, you do know putting pressure on the defense is hitting the ball in the trees too, right? I mean, you can, you can do it that way. 
And you're talking about a twitchy, twitchy athlete. So watching her on Sunday Night Baseball talk about hitting, great. But the twitch, she's, she can bunt, she can run. So in her mind, putting pressure on the defense is like that one nothing game or that 0-0 game that she's probably played so many times internationally. When professional, and so ultimately my point is, is that you are who you are and you are who you've been coached to be. And it's really good and important to stress the value of what you want them to do in certain situations. And um, I think that I can't stress that enough. I think that our players nowadays are playing so much more for themselves and showcasing their talents. And they don't understand the importance of team game. They don't understand what it means to be in a team game. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch baseball all year long and then you watch postseason baseball and you've got guys trying to bunt that never have, have bunted before and you're doing things different out of, out, of, you know, out of character. And so I think it's really important to me. I try to coach as much in practice like I would in the, in the, you know, in the final game at the College World Series and trying to figure out how to put as much pressure. But then at the end of the day, when you play those pressure games, you should already know who you are. Um, you can't bunt, so why are you trying to bunt? This kid can't hit the ball to right field, so why are you trying to hit the ball to right field? Just create some clear, um, um, non-confusing, situational things that the players can, can strive to. Um, you know, again, I, I look on here, um, to me, getting them to understand what, where they want to hit and how they want to hit. Um, again, I, I, the, the simple language of where do you want to hit the ball or what do you want the result to be, those are obvious. We want to hit. We want to get a hit. Um, but understanding exactly what you need to do to do those things and practice habits and, and continue that, that trend. Um, the homework side, and I'll be, be kind of brief, but I think this is, is, as I was talking about taking an amateur hitter to being a professional hitter, this area to me is, um, is the hardest thing to measure, is the homework side of things. And what I mean by that um, is, is really getting players to understand what, what, what size bat should you use? What size length, what size um, weight, you know, all the things that you, you should or, or shouldn't do. And so from a, from a strategic standpoint, I've had hitters that are, um, you know, they, they, they use a 34-inch bat. Our game is we have um, a minus 8, so a 34, 26, uh, 34, uh, 25, and a 34, 24. So a, a, an 8, 9, and a 10-ounce drop. And I know baseball obviously has a 3-ounce, and some guys use heavier than that. Um, and I think the length can go as high as maybe 36. I don't know what the exact number is, but um, our max is 34 inches in length. And it's so many times, you know, you, I've had hitters, you know, we, we, again, use, that's one thing I love about Blast and I love about some of the technology pieces is that you can really find maybe a true indicator of what somebody um, should swing or could swing or swings well. The hardest thing, and no matter what you do with, with if you're not getting game data, I don't know if you're actually getting the exact data point. So I think that's the hardest part for our game is we don't have a lot of um, whether flight scope or Hawkeye or, or um, hit tracks. We don't have that kind of data in our game yet and it's coming. So it's harder for us to make maybe some decisions. So you have to do a lot off feel. You have to do a lot off experience. Um, but I think finding the right type of bat um, to me is, is really, really important. Um, you know, is a shorter bat being closer to the plate maybe a little bit more effective for some, maybe for power hitters or maybe for some, but does a shorter bat have as much pop? And, you know, again, all that stuff's for, for science and data. So I think that's really, uh, really key for, for hitters. But I, I, the homework side to me is this is the biggest, the biggest change for me is getting hitters to understand who they are and how to work. And so I'll use my own, my own son's experience. And so I, I, I have a 20-year-old son who's pitching at a junior college in the state of Florida. And so he's six four and a half. I think he throws his highest velocity is 93, which got him at least the 25th round draft pick when I played. And, and, and he goes through some experiences. Of, well, his breaking ball velocity isn't as high as it needs to be, but yet he gets guys out. So there's a lot of data points in go, but I'll use my experience as a parent. He said, you ask him when he's little, what do you want to be? You know, well, I want to play in the big leagues. I want to play in the NFL, and I want to play in the NBA. And automatically, as a parent, you laugh, and then none of that's going to happen. Well, that's, I think that's a mistake, and I go backwards to you know, my playing career, just trying to really say, to, well, if you want to be this, well, then you're going to have to do this. You can't work like you're working now. You can't be on your phone Snapchatting for 11 and a half hours a day and sleeping for eight and going to school, for, it's not going to, so you have to learn how to work. So I really feel like um, I, I've done a really good job with each one of my hitters to understand. We have some hitters on our team, no matter how hard they work, no matter how much they work, they're never going to be able to hit at a high level. They're just not. 
And that's okay, but I think what, what the better way to approach that might be, hey, let's work as hard as you can and hopefully get you as far as you can go. And at the end of the day, you've impacted my life in a positive way. And I think that's, that's something that we miss as coaches because we're always looking at numbers. We're always looking at data and we're always trying to win. But sometimes you don't realize the small victories that you can have with a kid. Just getting them an inch better is probably going to be something that they'll cherish for the rest of their life. Um, but basically telling somebody they're not going to get somewhere, I don't think that's possible. I think if, they, if you want to get there, you're going to have to do this, this, and this. You may have to work, change your body. You may have to lift better, eat better, do other things. So getting them to understand that I think is, is really, really important. Um, the homework side of here, this is, this is probably a little bit more um, advanced for some than others. Um, but I think that we assume that players watch film. We assume that players read the scouting report that we produce. Um, we, we, we do our scouting reports every Tuesday and Thursday. So Tuesday is a midweek opponent. Thursday is our weekend opponent. And so we have some checkpoints within the game. Is, is, does the scouting report match the pitcher? Does the scouting report match the hitters? Does the scouting report match the team? Um, and so we try to deliver those scouting reports in a, in a, in a way so we only have 20 hours a week. So we try to deliver that through, uh, we, have a, we have an app that we use that all of our team shares, and we deliver that. Well, it's amazing. You deliver that on Tuesday, you get to your Wednesday pregame, and only a handful of people have actually accessed it or actually read it or actually know it. A lot of times we provide a little bit of video, not a lot of video, but we provide a little bit of video. It's amazing how they haven't watched the video or seen the video. So being able to get the players to understand who they're gonna play, um, understanding themselves, but then when you take them to, to understanding how to win and do things differently, going to have to do a great job of being able to understand that not all players are going to do what you think they're going to do. Um, and so maybe carving some time to, to be able to teach them how to watch video, watch scouting reports, read scouting reports, and what does that mean to them personally. So I was, I was talking a little bit to, to Jeff yesterday, and one of the things I'm going to try to do a better job this year is create a small card for every one of our hitters when we face, so if we're playing a Wednesday game, it's one opponent on a Wednesday, have a card of, hey, when we face this pitcher, this is what you're looking for. This is what she's going to throw you. Um, if she throws you this pitch, don't swing at it. You can't hit it anyway. Um, if you're going up there with a, with a true understanding of a, of a plan as opposed to all the things we do as coaches, hey, do you have a plan? What's your approach? What's your we, we, we say all the right things, but yet we don't always apply the right type of data to our players to, to, to keep it simple, but yet still be prepared. And I think that's the, the biggest thing that I want to have simplicity, but also making sure that we go through all the checkpoints to help them, you know, uh, achieve or reach success. So making sure we can, we can do that the right way within the amount of time. Um, I put on here, um, some other things. Uh, so one thing that I, <laughs> this, uh, I, I chuckle every time I see it. So we're, this is an experience. We're playing uh, Michigan in 2015. We won the World Series in 2014, the year before. And um, we, 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 were, we played well. We beat them. So we got the one. It's a three-game series. We beat them. The next day, we face Michigan again. They throw a pitcher at us, left-handed pitcher. And, I mean, I, don't, I think the final score was either one nothing or 2 nothing. We got a hit, maybe two hits. We couldn't get anything out of the infield. Everything was off our hands. And after the game, I, I mean, I, again, lost it. I'd never done this to a team ever. I shut the door, kicked the bat girl out of the, didn't allow the video cameras in, shut the door, and just wore our team out. Because this generation, this is what I was hearing. So what's the back-to-back -back tattoo going to look like? What are we going to get after we win the championship? So you already get players that are, they're, 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 they, what, is, what do you think they're going to say about me on social media? Or what are they going to do on Twitter or Instagram? Or what's our picture going to look like in the dog pile? And so these are all things that you're going through, and you have to manage that as a coach. Well, I didn't manage it. I let them be. They're confident. They're going to take. They're going to kick butt tonight. We got our ass handed to us. She pitched her butt off. Was really, really good. And I wore them out. I mean, I just went nutso, and uh, I, I raised my voice to a level that hasn't been raised before in a in a post game. And um, then went back to the film and watched. And so one of the things that we did is a left-handed pitcher with a really good curveball, and all our. Right-handers are bad, our left-handers are bad, but especially our right-handers, and we had some pretty good power in there. So this is not something I probably would recommend, but I decided that we were going to choke up. The next, they're going to throw her again. That's the beauty of our game or the bad part. When somebody throws it and shoves it, they're going to, they're going to come shove it again. And um, so we, 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 we came up with a plan. We're going to get on the top of the plate, and we're going to choke up. Not two inches, but 
four, five, and six inches. I mean, it was, I told our hitters, we may look terrible today, but if we get jammed, we're at least going to get jammed on the barrel as opposed to our hands over and over again. And, and again, I don't know if it was sports psychology or not. We rolled up a four spot in the first inning. We had a homer. We got, we, we did everything that we practiced to do. We'd practiced something similar to this before, but in this game, it was more about winning than what you thought of yourself or what your swing looked like. Or what, People were going to say, why are you choking up that much? Who cares if you win? If you lose, you got to answer the questions. But if we would have stayed normal stance, normal grip, normal everything, I, I know that she would, have, she would have done it again. So we got on top of the plate, choked up a lot. And, and again, like I said, it wasn't like she threw anything different. We just were getting jammed a little bit more on the barrel, got a little better extension. And um, I think those are things that, uh, to me, are, are really um, are really good. I'm going to wrap up here with, uh, with this and then, and then open for maybe a couple questions if there is one. Um, I think these are things that are, that are this. So, again, you have all your tech people. And all your tech people, if they were really, 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 really good at managing, they would be managers. But they're good tech people. They can provide you with good information. Good people can provide good management skills. Good people can provide um, some different plans of attack. Good relationships can provide good information in, 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 in situations of fear, panic, and confusion in a game when you're getting your butt kicked or you're getting jammed or you're just not performing at a, different, at a, at a high level. So I think that, uh, to me, one of the things that I feel like I don't have to worry about the numbers as much is I can read people. I can read my players. I understand my players. I know their strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I think all these things in game management are really important. Um, we're not a huge sit-on-a-pitch type team. We never have been. We're, we're somebody where we're going to go up there and hunt change-ups or we're going to go up there and cut the plate in half. Um, we've been somebody that I, I haven't really just haven't done a whole lot of, uh, of, of relaying pitches and doing things like that. Um, I do think that obviously great hitters have great eyes and they can see things different when pitchers throw things different. Um, and so I think that, you know, these are all things that we ask and we, we, we is what's the umpire zone like? I'll give you one umpire zone, um, one umpire zone thing that this will tell you the, the, the hitters at times, especially competitive hitters. Um, I had a hitter on Friday night. She struck out to end the game with bases loaded and it was a, it was a, a tight game. Uh, her reaching base, I think would have tied it. We come back the next day on Saturday, same opponent. She comes up, she's batting, I think she was batting sixth, and she swings at the first pitch on a check swing, hits a weak ground ball, she's left hand, hit a weak ground ball to short, and I'm, I coach third and on deck, and I'm walking down the on deck circle, getting all the way to the, the mouth of the dugout, and I said to her, what are you swinging at? And I just said it just like that. And she goes, that guy rung me up on that pitch last night. And I stopped for, I'm like, you do know that that guy is now coach, is umpire in third base now, not even the home plate guy, right? And she looked at me like, like just some of the things you have to manage with, with competitors um, that you just don't realize uh, until you ask. And I think those are things that are, that are really, really important. I, I, I skipped over this a little bit ago, but understanding the difference between somebody being competitive and somebody being stubborn. Um, and again, I have a terrible time coaching stubborn. I just can't do it. Um, I know baseball is a pastime and, you know, hitters always stand in the back of the box and toe the back, toe the back line because pitchers are throwing super, super hard. In our sport, we have the ability maybe to take away pitches by moving in the box, whether it be on the plate, like I said before, maybe moving up in the box a little bit to take away a, a good drop or moving back a little bit to take away a good elevated, uh, good slow change up and things. But um, to me, I think the in-game management um, is, is probably the, the nuts and bolts of really being able to take all the stuff that you work with in your plan and truly, truly developing um, and getting the most uh, out of your players because this is where the, 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 the mental part of the game takes over when the failure hits. And so I think it's really important to, to get your hitters and understand who they are and, and build that strong and, uh, and, and trustworthy relationship. So... Um, that was all I have. I'll, I'll defer. But I, this was really an honor. I, I can't tell you how um, I just have seen the evolution of not only softball but baseball and listening to the terms and watching the guys hit. And uh, it's so impressive to be around people that are willing to share. Um, and again, uh, I'm Tim W at Gators.ufl.edu. It's a it's all it's a standard Gator email. Um, but I'm Tim W. If you need something, um, I've had big league managers call me with daughters before about certain things and programs and stuff like that. I'd be happy to share any, anything with anybody at any time. Just reference the Slugfest uh, conference and uh, be happy to share any of my, my details that I gave you here. 
Um, again, I, I give more of the dumbed down version of, uh, of what it takes to, uh, to be successful, I think, and, and it, it, it helps me. I'm, I'm, I'm confident in what I do. The more information I get, the more I start thinking I'm doing it wrong. So, um, but I appreciate being here very much and uh, kick back over to you, Jeff. Um, so one thing I'm interested in that you talked about, you know, a lot of where things are going now is the technical side, um, technology and um, metrics and you name it. Um, but I feel like you've done a really good job of not just integrating that into your program, but pointing it towards winning. Um, and, you know, one thing that I noticed that you talked a lot more about was, you know, we've talked about it this, this weekend, but especially uh, in this talk. And, um, you know, the difference between, like, having a good swing and being a good hitter and being a good hitter or whatever and actually turning that into um, winning games. So I'm just interested to hear more of your thought process on that, on kind of integrating all the technology or whatever it is or the new things that you've seen in your career over 15 years at Florida and how you've consistently pointed those towards the outcome of winning the World Series. Yeah, I think the, the number one <laughs> that I can say is my ultimate goal isn't to win the College World Series. And, and I think it's easy for me to say that now um, because I've won a, won a World Series as a player, won a World Series as an assistant coach and a head coach. So it's easy for me to say that's not my goal. Um, I really enjoy the, the, the day. And I like practice more than I like the games. It's more fun to me. It's a better – I love practicing. And like I said, I think it's those bicycle trips that I made when I was younger and the, the things that I've got out of it. But I use, I equate to this thing. If the guys that hit the longest drive were the best golfers, then I'd put a lot more value into all the metrics because those dudes can hit the heck out of the golf ball. But yet when you ask them to make a tough shot out of the sand onto the green or putt from X amount of distance, they, they don't, then not all those guys can do that. Um, so I don't think that the, the metrics and all the things within the metrics are the ultimate measurement of, of, of good players. But I do know this, that if we as coaches don't get on board with metrics and with, with technology, we're going to be fired. We're not going to get good players because players are being, they're being, more, uh, they're being, more, they're being exposed more to technology now at a younger age and they're going to find that they're going to go places and they're going to probably move potentially further with people that can help them with the language and help them understand the things that they've already learned. So I think we as coaches have to get on board with technology and get on board with, again, kinesiology and all the other things that are really important to strength and, uh, uh, and, and hitting. Um, so I think that technology, to me, in my mind, is, is the wave of the future that we need to know so we can have educated conversations with, with, with future employers but at the end of the day, the, the, the real part of it's the relationships. I think the relationships have to stay strong. You can't just do everything by numbers um, because numbers don't always mean that guy can get a hit in a crucial situation. So I think those are things important to look at. Awesome. Everybody have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for having me.